The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Stephanie Weiss, Director of Education and Events for AGRIP. We've got about 12.59 on the phone here, and we're going to give folks just a couple more minutes to um, get online with us and to join us. And we expect that we'll start in just a couple of minutes. When we get rolling, I'll do a formal introduction of both our session and our presenter, as well as some logistical notes that'll be important for all of you who are joining us. We'll be back in a couple minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon again, everyone. My name is Stephanie Weiss. As I mentioned, I'm the Director of Education and Events for AGRIP. Thanks for joining us today. Today's webinar is called Next Generation Strategies for PBMs, From Opaque to Transparent in 60 Minutes. The session is designed to provide an update and overview of pharmacy benefits management. Before I introduce our speaker, I have a couple of logistical notes for our attendees. First, everyone is automatically muted. If you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the chat question field on the webinar panel. Questions that are directly related to the information at hand will be addressed as we go. We will record this presentation and post it to the AGRIP website later in the week so that you can view it or share it with your colleagues if you wish. And now about our presenter. Court Orsborn is the president of Don and Company. I'm excited about this webinar because Court originally joined us at AGRIP in Baltimore last October at the Fall Educational Forum. His session on PBMs was very well received, and so we're grateful that he was open to the idea of sharing an updated version of his presentation with us today. Court is responsible for the development and implementation of Donco's cutting edge, edge strategies for optimized managed care programs. He also oversees ongoing management of Donco's client programs. Court is highly respected within the healthcare industry for his expert knowledge and willingness to be transparent. His market insight and quantitative aptitude are key factors in his ability to assess the actual performance of managed care vendors. Before 2002, Court held varied positions in finance and strategic management, including for the Healthcare and Higher Education Group of Standard & Poor's Public Finance Division. With that, I'll now turn it over to Court. Thank you. Thanks, Stephanie, and um, thanks everyone for joining me, to, me and us today. Um, if you have any questions as we're going through, I think, Stephanie, there, um, the option is to uh, text you or IM you a question, and uh, please feel free to do so, and um, we can uh, answer relevant questions as we go through the presentation. Um, no problem about interrupting. Um, so, uh, as Stephanie mentioned, this is a very similar presentation to what we presented in October in Baltimore with a couple of updates and um, wanted to make sure that, that this information got out to all of the membership um, for those who attended, if they want to get a refresher on it, um, and just make it accessible and, and hopefully helpful to everyone. The idea of what we're doing here is to, um, to give you practical tools uh, for 
effectively and um, and relatively easily, optimizing your PBM uh, and and the financial performance of it. So just a quick overview of PBM and, and pharmaceutical spend. Um, here's a couple of charts from the Brookings Institute uh, of, of what your costs as a whole are generally looking like from pharmacy. So it's typically going to be 10 to 20 percent of your total medical spend. And this is going to be um, for both group health and for work comp. Um, so uh, I know we have members who are coming from both sides of, uh, of the delivery systems. And there's going to be a lot of overlap between what we're talking about here. It's going to apply to both group health and to work comp. And I'll try to point out where there are distinctions between the two um, and differences, but let's say 80% of, of what we're talking about here today applies to, to everyone. Um, on these charts, a couple of things you'll note is the increased cost of, of prescription spending as a percent of your total healthcare spend and as a percent of GDP. Um, it dipped down a little while, maybe 30 years ago, but it's been on the rise ever since then. There's been a little bit of relief in the last few years. I think that's probably due to a lot of big name prescription drugs coming off patent and you're getting a little bit of relief from them going generic, but it's kind of just, um, it's kind of just a, a little intermission between what's otherwise an increasing trend. Um, and then on the chart on the right, you can see um, the explosion of how much of this cost is borne by um, the private insurer and the government. Uh, in particular, the, the private uh, insurer has, has borne it for the last 20 years. So it's something that really falls on the shoulders of the payer. Um, PBM pricing is, is highly variable. So I think you'd be surprised to, to see um, what pricing some people have. You can have a gigantic payer um, plan sponsor who has mediocre pricing and you might have a, a relatively small sponsor or payer who has really good pricing. It really tends to vary, but I would say uh, in almost all cases that there, whatever pricing the payer has, there's usually substantial improvement to be had. Um, even if you have really good pricing, um, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of the rare case where someone has optimized pricing. Um, it's kind of a function of, of what you've seen going on in, in um, the PBM product as a whole over the last 25 years. Uh, it started out as a really simple price reduction mechanism, uh, kind of the basic PPO network idea, um, group purchasing, network discounts, and it's evolved into a very complicated product with the pricing discounts themselves being one of the most complex pieces. Um, it's, it's kind of a black box, uh, which the PBMs control and, and which you have very little transparency into. Um, knowing just how they're getting their discounts, to what degree um, they're passing it on to you, and all of the various mechanisms that uh, that create the discounts. Um, the product's expanded, I think, for the better. Um, it's a valuable product now that we have uh, additions such as they manage your formulary, they provide you data analytics and reporting, perform clinical management for you, um, and then they have branched out uh, into ancillary services like providing mail order delivery and like providing specialty drugs directly. Um, the PBM really serves two masters. They serve you, uh, their constituent, in trying to aggregate your buying power to theoretically get you optimized pricing. But I think I used this analogy in, in October. I really think of it like a Nat Geo special where it's a bunch of lions hunting the, the, the antelope or the buffalo in the savannah and they're all working together but the minute they bring the buffalo down it's every man it's every lion for themselves and every lion is trying to grab as much of the meat as they can and that's what that is a good analogy as far as uh, your relationship with your PBM um, you guys are working together to get better drug pricing from the upstream manufacturers pharmacies wholesalers uh, but as you're doing so you got to be very cautious about who is keeping what share of, of that reduced pricing and is it fair um, we look at the service suite here and in some cases the sponsor of payers is um, 
is focused on some operational elements or service elements, the PBM will always want you to focus on that and say it's, it's superior utilization management um, and service delivery that you want to be focused on. Don't worry about the pill price. Um, when we respond to that, we want both. We want superior service and we want great pricing on a per pill basis, and you can have both. So um, some basic terms I want to level set on uh, as we're going through here. You're probably familiar with a lot of these, um, but um, I think it's good to kind of set the foundation of, of how we think of these things. Um, AWP, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of and, and know about, um, stands for average wholesale price, and you can think of it as the, the main drug sticker price nationally for, for most or all delivery systems. It has uh, a lot of drawbacks, which I think a lot of people have heard about and are familiar with, but the one advantage that it has is its ubiquity because it's the, one of the few, if only, uh, pricing benchmarks that, that's readily available, covers most drugs, most people understand. Um, you know, there's a lot of alternatives out there that seek to be, cut, to be a better, more accurate representation of what a fair drug price is. You know, but they might have gaps. They might get updated every three months. They um, uh, they might not be available to everyone. You know, there's a lot of those kinds of things going on, which make it hard to get away from AWP. Pass through pricing. So basically, this what this is is you, you've heard about this too. Um, what it means is whatever the PBM is paying the pharmacy, they are billing you. So if the PBM bills pays $50 to the pharmacy, they turn around, they bill you $50 plus a fixed markup, usually a per, per claim for the group folks or a per script for the comp folks fee. It has a couple advantages. It's transparent. You know exactly what your markup is um, or should know. And you are piggybacking the increased buying power of the PBM. The big keep getting bigger, as you know. Um, the PBMs, are continually striving to just get as big as they can to increase their buying leverage. And as they do that, they're driving better rates with the pharmacies. And if you have a pass through pricing structure, then you are piggybacking that with them. Um, MacList is basically a PBM's proprietary rates that they have with, with different pharmacies. Um, your pricing can be based, this is another alternative that your pricing can be based on. Rebates. Um, the key thing here is to say, is to know that rebates aren't just rebates. They're re rebates by any other name. So um, rebates can be hidden in the form of data analytics fees or admin fees. There's a lot of different names that, that, that PBMs and manufacturers will attach to rebates to, to hide them. Um, integration. So there's, there's two kinds of integration. There's the integration between the PBM and your plan or your TPA, and then and that's kind of a um, operational interface. And then there's data and um, patient management integration by combining the data from group health and work comp, um, which runs into HIPAA issues on the group health side a lot of times and, and is difficult to achieve for that reason. Um, so a quick note on the differences between group health and work comp. So the biggest thing is program size. The group health program is typically going to be seven to eight times larger than the work comp. And uh, correspondingly, we'll have more pricing leverage and we'll typically see better pricing. As an example, you're going to see um, pretty commonly pass-through pricing in group health. It's pretty achievable. Whereas in work comp, it's, it's pretty rare. Um, it's hard for only the biggest or the best position payers are really getting uh, a bite at that apple. Um, drug classes, so in, in group health, you're seeing the full spectrum of disease and conditions, whereas in comp, it's very pain-centric. Um, and, and kind of correspondingly, um, you've got different things to worry about. Um, if I jump down two bullets, in group health, you're worrying about adherence. You want people to be on their medications because a lot of the time um, it's going to be ultimately overall more cost effective and more health effective than them not being on their meds. Whereas in group in work comp, 
uh, you're facing more of an issue of dependence. There's a lot of pain drugs again, so you are trying to uh, make sure that you're not using these drugs too much and you're not abusing them. Jumping up a bullet, so uh, some of the differences are in controls and formulary, where in group health, you uh, are trying to incentivize the use of certain drugs and you don't control what the, what the uh, member is using. Whereas in comp, you do have compensability control, um, and that really drives what, uh, what drugs are used and dispensed. Um, specialty drugs is really big in group health, whereas it's typically nominal for, for work comp, although there are some cases uh, you might have a, a health plan, for instance, that has a lot of frontline medical employees who are getting a, a significant exposure um, to things like hepatitis and other viruses where you have um, prophylactic, um, expensive specialty drugs being dispensed at a pretty high rate, but typically it's more rare. Um, so this is a little bit of a complicated chart. Um, so you don't need to, to look too deeply at it. It's really just there to, to, to highlight the, the fact that there's a number of players in the pharmacy value chain overall. Um, at the top of it being the payer, um, who is usually interfacing with the PBM, but sometimes the pharmacy, and then behind them you have wholesaler and manufacturer. And a couple of the biggest dynamics in the market are, are one, consolidation, the big trying to get bigger. It's all about buying power. Um, ESI, Optum, CVS, Caremark, um, such huge buyers. Um, and they, uh, the name of the game for them is to continue to get as big as they can. That's, that's really drives everything in their business for them. Um, and then you have vertical integration, which is just really another way to, to drive margin. Um, it, it happens up and down the value chain. The most recent, you have CVS, Caremark, a far, CVS, Caremark, a pharmacy, PBM, and now a pair by Netna. You have PBMs acquiring each other. You have pharmacies acquiring or merging with wholesalers in the, in the case of Walgreens Alliance Boots, um, and basically everywhere up and down the chain, you're seeing that. Um, kind of here's the competitive landscape, uh, and it's a little bit different from group to work comp. For group, uh, the size of the font here represents how big the PBM is, and in group health, you've got the big three: Express Scripts, CVS, Caremark, Optum. Uh, $100 billion companies. Um, and then below them, Prime, Humana, Med Impact, they're mid-market, so they have, um, they're not completely out of the ballpark in terms of size of the bigger players, but they're, they're definitely a lot smaller. Whereas in work comp, it's, it's, it's really polar. You have Express Scripts and Optum um, on, the, on, the, on the large side, and then everyone else in the market is extremely small comparatively. ESI, Optum, $100 billion companies, whereas the rest of these guys are, are several hundred million. Um, you would think that that would create uh, a situation where you don't have really many options and these smaller guys really can't compete with the, with the big players. To a degree, that's true. But um, kind of su it's surprisingly, there is... Uh, a fair amount of competitiveness and niches, little windows of, of, of superior terms that you can obtain through several of these players. Um, it just takes some effort, some digging, and uh, but it can be found. And in general, things are in pretty good shape in that market. Um, on the group health side, it's kind of it's a little more static. Things have been this way for a long time, um, and you, you have kind of a different. Uh, layout of, 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 of the value proposition that you're getting for some of these guys, like an Express Scripts is uh, obviously the, the, big, the big player, um, the number one in the market, and, and, and they're going to tout that. Whereas a CVS Caremark might say, um, we have, uh, we can cut you a really good carve out, narrow network deal with CVS pharmacies. You know, that's, a, that's an advantage they have. An OptumRx might say, well, our integration with United is, um, gives us a, a real advantage in terms of, of data integration and predictive modeling. Um, 
finding people who are at risk of a health event. A prime might say we have a really strong relationship with the mid-tier blues, um, a great product uh, built together with them. Uh, we're a high-touch service company with, 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 a, with a service focus. Uh, these are kind of the different value props that you're going to get from these guys. Uh, a CVS Caremark now might be angling to um, to promote the strength they have in data in, in integration between health plan and PBM, just like Optum. Uh, that's, that might be something that you see in the next few years. So uh, a little interlude between um, between the presentation. This is uh, uh, just a video of of a, a forum from the Aspen Institute, the uh, uh, the big think tank, and uh, uh, a session that they had on uh, just drug costs in general. And um, it kind of highlights the um, just just the, the many issues and 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 irrationality of the PB of the pharmacy um, market. Court, can you turn up the audio on your end? We're having difficulty hearing it from here. Is that better? It's, it's cutting out. You might have to just give us a summary of what's going down. Sure. Okay. So apologies for that, everyone. Um, this, this speaker, what he was saying, is um, he's pointing out the rationality of the drug pricing market and how when you go to the store, you have no idea what your price will be. And it genuinely could be a, a $4 to $150 for the same drug, depending on what plan you're in or what um, what coverage you have. And um, he's speaking about how if that happened with a loaf of bread, there'd be a riot. Um, and I think this this video in general it's 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 good for perspective on kind of what are are these big conceptual issues that uh, everyone is facing with pharmaceuticals, um, and, and they talk about kind of you know philosophical um, again uh, conceptual strategies for how can we really address the problem of drug pricing. Um, but what I, what I want to talk about is what you can do about it now. Um, it's interesting. The speaker goes on to talk about Amazon, who's getting into the PBM space probably. That's an interesting thing to watch. Um, uh, but even that is kind of, you know, not something in the here and now. And uh, we think that what you want to be doing is, is, is trying to get the low-hanging fruit and trying to uh, do things that are effective now and, and doable. Uh, to help control your pharmacy costs and, and how you're doing in this in, in this value chain. Okay, so um, this, this section now, section two, we're talking about um, some of the actual uh, tools that you can use, some of the dynamics you need to worry about uh, when you're looking at your PBM uh, deal. So where do PBMs make money? We've got uh, several areas. So the first is the price spread, and that's they pay X uh, to the pharmacy for the drug and turn around and, and bill you Y. Um, the question is, is what is that markup? It, it, that's that's often the the one of the most opaque areas uh, of of your financial arrangement. 
uh, MDR, again, so manufacturer-derived revenue, rebates, and other things that are like rebates. Services, so they may bill you a la carte for, for any number of services, um, clinical management, peer reviews, pharmacist reviews, data analytics, a lot of different things. And in general, what the position we try to take is to the, basically all of your services should be bundled into one single fee. Your fee for the drugs should cover almost every service except for highly in-depth physician peer review type discussions. And that's kind of the one area where we tend to, to accept um, additional fees. So you don't want to have a lot of a la carte modular pricing. Uh, it gets really complicated, hard to follow, hard to track your real cost. Verticalization, um, again, so uh, as you branch out into different parts of the vertical, it gives you more control over margin and allows you to create revenue streams. So um, as an example, so when you think about, so pharmacies, PBMs uh, have gotten into mail order delivery. And so they are the actual pharmacy delivering the mail order um, prescriptions. And if you think about the mail order fulfillment centers of, of a large PBM and ESI and Optima, CVS, Caremark, these are gigantic hubs that um, that address regionally, if not nationally, all of the PBM's activity. You have countless amounts of pills coming in and out of there every day. Um, some of these come in gigantic packages and are being repackaged into smaller packages, which I think um, this is another thing that you'll have heard about and kind of a familiar buzz problem out there is repackaged drugs, drugs being put into different uh, quantities which have different pricing because each quantity has a different price under the NDC billing codes. Um, how, how is anyone really going to effectively track what's been repackaged and, and what the PBM really paid for a drug and what they're billing you now? It's, it's, uh, it's an impossible thing to audit. Um, at the same time, PBMs push mail order and try to suppress 90-day fills at retail. Uh, Representative uh, Collins out of Georgia, this is this is kind of a, a big thing on on his docket is um, his PBM abuses, and he talks a lot about um, PBMs sending out letters to members and injureds telling them that they can't fill 90-day prescriptions at the pharmacy; they have to fill it through mail order. Um, which is, again, owned by the PBM. So they're really trying to reroute all of this activity through their own, through their own um, proprietary operation uh, and sometimes misleading the patient and the payer. So it, but that's one pitfall and, um, of, of the several that I'm going to get into as we go forward on the next few slides. Um, first thing that first component, big component of, of your financial arrangement with your PBM is your price. Um, again, so the, the price, optimal pricing is going to vary by system and, and how much leverage you have. Um, we talked about past through being rarer and more comp and more common in group. The other typical pricing scheme you're going to see is an AWP based rate. So some discount off AWP and it'll be uh, two different prices for brand and generic. It'll be AWP minus X for brand and AWP minus Y for generic. Um, pass-through is kind of the the holy grail of pricing, and everyone wants it, but, but it's important to know that there's more than w one way to skin a cat. Both of these structures can work, and both have their pitfalls. Um, pass-through pricing, for instance, so we have a client who relatively small had passed through pricing um, and the terms were great, but uh, there was a loophole in the contract that allowed the PBM to get out of the pass through pricing, unilaterally change the pricing to something else if um, a legislative event occurred, which actually wasn't related to, um, to anything having to do with pricing, didn't really affect the pricing that much. Um, we knew the loophole was there, we couldn't get rid of it. Uh, and it, and it came back, to bite us. Uh, we also found that the PBM wasn't in fact pricing to pass through. So they were, they were billing us something that wasn't actually what they were paying the pharmacies. Um, these are, so 
you know, that gets to an audit of pass-through. It's, it's, um, you may have pass-through pricing, but are you really getting it? Um, if you were to convert pass-through pricing or AWP-based pricing to an optimal rate, uh, what you'd want to, where you'd want to be, an, a, a starting point of a really good rate for work comp would be AWP minus 15% for brand and 60 and up for generic. So it can get higher than that. And I'm really talking about something like California where the fee schedule is even better than that and, and is a real outlier um, nationally. On the group side, you've got uh, AWP minus 22 and 78. That's a good benchmark for your pricing. Uh, a good takeaway for where, where, what ballpark you want to be in to be in at a competitive pricing rate, uh, or again, pass through rates. So the second thing you want to worry about, a uh, big component of your of your financial arrangement with the PBM, is, is the contract definitions for a lot of key things that drive pricing. Uh, first thing is brand versus generic, and um, this is these first three bullets are going to apply to an AWP based situation. Um, pasture is different. It's got a separate set of issues, which we'll get to. But for an AWP-based structure, where you have different, more expensive prices for brand um, than generic, you want to be sure that brand and generic drugs are precisely defined. Because if they're not, the PBM can shift what should be generic drugs into the brand category and bill you at the much higher brand pricing. Um, so you want your definitions of brand and generic locked down uh, based on the multi-source codes from Medispan, which is the main AWP source. Um, there's six, seven different codes, and three of them belong in brand and three belong in generic, um, for instance. Uh, second thing is, is uh, AWP source, and it's kind of the same thing. Uh, your pricing in an AWP-based structure is based on AWP, but what AWP? And for any given drug, um, Medispan and Redbook might have different AWP levels. One might be 100, one might be 120. Um, you don't know. The PBM can shift to the AWP that is favorable for them in terms of creating a higher price. This is a rarer um, problem than the brand and generic definition thing, which is a very common problem, but it's still something that best practice you want to address in your contract. Um, your pricing may also be based on MAC list. So your pricing may be AWP minus X or the PBM's MAC price, whichever is better. Uh, in that structure, you then have to worry about what is, what is, how is MAC defined? Because, uh, for instance, there's, uh, take one of the larger PBMs, they have over 50 MAC lists. So if you don't lock down the MAC list and say it's, you know, it's the best, um, MAC pricing out of all of your MAC lists, they could charge you um, off one MAC list rate that's, that's higher than the one they're actually paying the pharmacy. So uh, AWP might be, AWP minus X might be $100 for a drug. Their MAC list price, the PBM's MAC list price with the pharmacy may be 50, but they may have another MAC list that lists the drug at 70, and they may bill you at that MAC price, and you want the $50 MAC price. Um, so another thing to be specific about in your contract. And then again, uh, MDR specifying that you are due back all rebates and all other manufacturer derived revenue um, by any name. Uh, third key point for your contract is SLAs. So th this is something that um, I should point out, I think is not, isn't necessary for every a buyer. Um, it's something that we would recommend in a case where you've had some operational issues or concerns in the past. Um, either you've actually had a problem or you just know there's something really specific about your operations that you want handled very precisely uh, and you need assurance that it's going to be done well. In those situations, SLAs are a really great way to, um, to incentivize the, the PBM to deliver it operationally. And um, you would want to have it for every issue that is material to you. And it could be billing accuracy, it could be generic penetration, card issuance, timely and complete, um, call center availability, they're responding to calls every time in X number of seconds, um, adherence performance, 
control of opioid use for the comp people, uh, so on. Uh, every SLA, in order for it to be... Corey, uh, yeah. we have a question. Um, it relates to both this slide and the previous slide. And um, people wondering, or, or one of our members wondering, how likely people are to, how likely the PBMs are to actually be transparent on these points when pushed. Is, are they willing to easily open that door, or is that something that you need to tell us all over a little bit? And then the secondary part of the question is whether you can point the group to any resources where they might find sample language or clauses around some of what you're talking about. Okay, those are, those are great questions. Um, so the first, I'll take the first one, how willing is the PBM to do it? Um, to some degree, the, they'll almost always be willing. And I think it, it, that it's a, it's a matter of mindset that you have to go in there and, and have taken stock of, of kind of all the things you want and all of the different um, negotiating stances you could take to get it. Uh, you will definitely experience pushback uh, to some degree or another. Um, and I think it's, I think it's a matter of you, you, you want to kind of determine how far you can push this deal. Um, it, it's, Otherwise, the first position you you encounter is going to be is going to be, you know, we can't do any of it. And the PBMs have gotten really good at at putting together um, a kind of a presentation that that makes it look like there's nothing that can be done. You know, one of the larger, one of the big three PBMs. When you look at their contract, it looks kind of like a PDF. It looks like something that that's not really redlineable. You know, that that you um, can't really adjust. Um, it's it's extremely long and it's worded in a way that makes some dangerous things seem innocuous. Um, so th they have they put conscious thought into to putting together a presentation of of when someone goes out there and asks, hey, well, will you change this definition? No, we can't do that. You know, so um, bear in mind that they they can. And I think what you um, when you go into that process, you kind of have to. Um, decide which things you can and can't live with. You may not get everything. You will absolutely get something. Um, as far as sources for um, for where we can find examples of this, so um, I think um, I mean so each one of these points we can definitely provide you with with added detail around them. So if we go back a couple up to say for instance brand versus generic. I can send you a definition of what exactly that would look like in your contract. Um, you know, I, I, I'm hesitant to send out uh, a PBM's contract and point out, hey, here's their, uh, here's their uh, terms and here's the problems with it. But um, I can also find some stuff on the web, you know, where maybe that's pointed out. I, I can look around for that as well. Um, so yeah, we're a resource for it, and um, I, I'll look to put some of that stuff together. And if you have any specific things that you're looking for, um, I think it, uh, Stephanie can shoot those over to me if you send them to her. Thanks, Court. I'll do that. And um, if, if anybody does have questions after this about some of that language, just email me and we'll get your questions over to Court. Thanks, Stephanie. And, and thanks for the question, too. Um, so, Closing out the SLAs, so you want to, they're not really effective unless they, they have money tied to them and puts PBM skin in the game. They should be material typically. Um, you know, you want them to be a, a significant amount of, of, of fees. And you want to make them predictable and easily controllable. So just make this work for yourself, you know. Set up a simple number. It can even be a flat fee, um, a flat annual fee or a flat uh um, semi-annual fee. Um, one thing we have found, though, is, is you don't want to make them gimmies. So I, I would say don't SLA stuff that you think isn't really going to be a problem or you're not experiencing issues with. You end up just paying the PBM more money, you know, for kind of automatic slam dunk type performance. Um, so really focus this on the things that matter to you. And then you won't end up paying, you know, you might end up paying a couple percent instead of seven or eight percent. Um, okay, fourth, fourth important term or set of terms to look at in your, in your contract is audit rights. 
Um, and this becomes really important again for pass through, um, as you were mentioning. So a lot of these, going back a couple to the definitions, a lot of these definitions aren't so much of an issue in, in pass through. Brand versus generic, it doesn't matter as much when theoretically, whatever the definition is, you're paying the PBM what they paid the pharmacy and you don't need to worry about it. But what you do need to worry about is, is are you really paying the PBM what they're paying the pharmacy? You have to validate that and that's an audit thing. So you need those audit controls to get full transaction detail and get uh, full full pricing terms that the PBMs have with um, with with uh, with the pharmacies. You're not going to look at every one of the 60,000 different pharmacy agreements, but um, maybe you look at a few of the big ones, Walgreens or a Rite Aid, uh, something like that. You know, a representative sample that will cover a, a disproportionately large share of your of your activity. You don't want to be limited in the number of transactions you can audit. Um, you know, you'll see a lot out there. We limit our audit to 300 claims or scripts out of, you know, a hundred thousand. And, um, and it doesn't, it's not extrapolated across the rest of the hundred thousand. So what are you really getting back? If you find a few errors out of a small sample size, you want to get all the data points you're going to need to do the audit. If you don't get the different points that go into uh, determining the price of each prescription, then you're not going to be able to audit. Uh, you don't want your time frames limited. You don't want the number of audits you can do limited. Um, you don't want the, the people who you can do the audit to be limited. Um, that becomes a sticking point. But really, um, the, the PBM saying that um, we, we can't have people in here who we don't know looking through our proprietary data. Um, and I think a fair compromise there is just to specify that you're not going to audit the PBM's data using another PBM, one of their competitors. And, and, and I think that that should be sufficient to your PBM to give them comfort that uh, you're not exposing any of their proprietary information. Um, strategies for how you go about positioning yourself with your PBM. So we talked about the specific factors that you want to look at. Now this is kind of the negotiating strategy. I mean, what are some of the different angles you can play? Um, the first would be to align yourself and try to get your deal piggybacking your health plan or your TPA, your excess carrier, their buying power. So these institutional buyers represent about 75% of, of, of all PBM revenue in their systems. Um, they have significant sophistication uh, to go along with that buying power. So if you look at someone like an Anthem who is buying multiple multi-billions of dollars of drugs a year going through their PBM and their a health plan. So they are basically um, as sophisticated as the PBM in all facets of, of the PBM product and their buying power is enormous. And when you look at that kind of a, of a pair, you can see that they're going to have about as good of a deal as can possibly be achieved in PBM. And you know, if you look at current events, they weren't even happy with that, and they're going to go out and they're going to start their own PBM with CVS Caremark as kind of the, the blind-labeled OEM supplier who um, is not in, uh, you know, who's kind of sourcing back-end infrastructure and network, but they're not reaping the benefits of, of, um, of the network themselves. Um, and you can see these guys pushing to get an even better deal, and they're not satisfied until they have the absolute best. Um, and if you can get pricing uh, through them, then it's going to be great. The question is, is, is will they share that with you? And, and usually not, but there are cases where you have that unique relationship or, or they owe you one and, and you can leverage that. Something wor worth looking into. Uh, your second option would be to pool buying power. And you can do this. Um, the idea here, I think, is you can do this in any number of ways. You know, it's, it's highly flexible. Um, you could do it with your sister program. So for anyone on the group health side, you can connect with your work comp counterparts or vice versa, pull your buying power. And, um, you know, you're going to increase your volume. You're going to increase the strategic value because each account is the tail that wags the dog. 
Um, and the PBM is worried that if they lose one, it might the contagion might spread to the other. Um, that's probably the most significant thing about that combination. And, and it's very real, the P, and particularly for the group health side, um, they don't they don't want a loss of a work comp side to spread to group. And if they have that fear, then um, they're going to be much more accommodating to the to the comp program. Um, Another angle you can take is to work with sister agencies or, 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 or agencies that you have done purchasing with before. Um, or they could just open up to, um, to uh, other groups out there that, that do group purchasing, um, whether it's formal or informal. Um, it's important to keep in mind the flexibility that you have here. So you can have, you wanna have tiered pricing so that as you're block grows that that you get better and better price and get recognized for that growth um, and in a group purchasing unit virtual or otherwise or formal can can have multiple options so I mean we've seen this um, w w some of our pools your counterparts have have this structure where they have a lineup of vendors um, not just one so that their constituents can pick and choose from um, from a lineup and you really end up with a pretty good selection of, of different options if you don't like ESI for some reason you've had a bad experience or they don't um, Operationally fit fit what you're trying to do. Well, then we offer Optum um, Or CVS Caremark and so on Hey court, I want to just jump in because we have a comment um, that I'd like you to address from another one of our folks on the line um, they're saying that they have found that some B PBMs will not let you have access to the pricing data when you want to share that data with a specialty pharma algorithm solution such as Archimedes. And that when you want to pull the historical pharma data into a data warehouse, there's a similar tug of war. Do you have any comments or insight that you can offer around that? Stephanie, I'm sorry. Um, what, was, what was the first part? Uh, what would the PBM, they wouldn't share their overall yeah, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't provide access to the pricing data when the pool wanted to share that data with a specialty pharma algorithm solution provider such as Archimedes. Yeah, um, that, is, that is a bit of a challenge. Um, so uh, I, I, I can, I've experienced that in a number of fronts and it's kind of, it's it's kind of it's analogous to what we're talking about with um, with the audit rights. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna take that position, um, and you may not be able to to combat it. So um, a couple of avenues you could take is um, you could back into it through your own data. Um, you want to you want to check your contract to see if that runs afoul of 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 the of the PBM terms you have with your PBM. Or um, you could do, you could just work around it and work with data that you, you know, you can synthesize through your activity, through other sources that aren't necessarily, you know, the data that you are restricted from sharing, you know. So you can, you can um, synthesize something that looks like your data from other sources. Thank you. Sure. Um, so, uh, strategies for optimization. So the third thing you can do is you can go on your own, um, just directly without trying to put together purchasing leverage. And this is, this is, this gets back to the idea that there's still, even in a well-priced program, there's almost always still a material amount of improvement that you can extract. Um, and I think the two things, you, if you have, Good intel and a good strategy. So you want to take stock of what your leverage is. You know different different um, positioning that you have with the PBM, um, leverage of any sort that you have with them, and then you also want to um, educate yourself on some of the things that we talked about earlier with uh, the different price points and terms that you want to have in your in your agreement, and kind of laundry list out for yourself what you the, the wish list that you have. That you'd like to achieve. Um, if you aren't getting um, much traction or the traction that you want to get, 
you've always got the option to put it out the competitive bid or the threat of competitive bid. And, um, you know, we found that um, any, pretty much every time that that, that that option gets put on the table, the uh, willingness of the PBM to work with you increases. Um, and you're going to get some leverage probably just out of the threat and certainly out of if you actually want to go um, all the way and put, uh, put your program out to bid, that alone is going to uh, drive an improvement. Um, just a note on carving out. So we've kind of, we've talked about that in other settings. Uh, people who had a concern about, can I carve out my program and how do I manage it? Um, it's usually feasible under your contract. And, and even if it weren't, you know, it's something that you can negotiate with them again. And um, it, it's, it's operationally fully feasible. I think I, there are some cases um, and particularly with an optimum on the group side, there is some substance to the, um, the better mousetrap that they have through integration and uh, predictive modeling with, with their unified solution. But, but it, in most cases, it's still a, uh, a, a carve out program is still something that you, that will achieve what you want to achieve and, and you won't see a significant drop off in, in your operational performance. And then on the comm side, uh, I would say that's even more so the case. Um, I don't really see much benefit, if any, from the bundled solution. It's, it's really not doing anything for you um, other than uh, allow, uh, being an argument for the, for the TPA to keep, uh, to keep all of these ancillary services bundled under their umbrella and have, having them realizing those peripheral revenue streams. Um, so I wouldn't be worried about carving out. I wouldn't be scared of it. And um, uh, either operationally or in terms of, of uh, feasibility contractually. So, Clark, um, Clark, may I interrupt one more time? I, I think um, sure. one of our listeners is asking a little bit more about some of the data aggregation, I believe. Um, and they've done some of the data aggregation for five companies from, um, well, from 700 EE to 13,000 EE. And I apologize for not knowing what EE means in this context. Um, and they're saying that this challenge is... Oh, uh, that'd be employee. Oh, okay. It is employee. For 700 to 13,000 employees. And the challenge is that um, this is something that most clients are shocked to find out whose data it really is. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, that ownership of data. I think that's what the individual is looking for and how we actually break down um, getting more clarity around that. How do, how do we simplify that process a bit? Um, so a good example of that would be, would actually be one of our pools who's, who's had a lot of discussions over, over years about data integration and the PBM is always going to um, take the conservative and on the passive stance and be hesitant to share any, any data. Um, but it's really, it really is as, as the uh, listener mentioned, it is your data and it's really, it's really you who uh, um, bears the responsibility of any data breach. I mean, well, sharing of data outside of, uh, out, that, that violates HIPAA, for instance. Um, after, after a lot of discussion, the PBM agreed to support the pool with whatever data integration they wanted to do. And then it, it does kind of fall on the, on the, uh, on the sponsor and payer uh, to, to set it up and, and um, not violate HIPAA on the group health side. But, um, you know, it's really, so what, what that means is you're not sending the group data over to comp, you're sending the comp data over to group because the comp side doesn't have the same HIPAA restrictions. And there's not, um, there's not, that's, that's a feasible approach. And uh, if you keep, if you keep pushing that concept with the PBM, I mean, we found that, that they'll, that they'll support it. Thank you for that. Um, sure. Now that that program hasn't gone forward with that, and I think there's a little bit of hesitancy uh, on management side to to actually go ahead and do it. Um, 
you know, it's a little bit scary when you kind of, you come up to the actual, you know, time to pull the trigger. Um, but conceptually in concept, it, it, it shouldn't, it, you shouldn't be violating any, any requirements. Um, so just as a, just as a summary, kind of what I'd leave you with, uh, as we've gone through all this, I think it's, it's, it's easy to get overwhelmed by, uh, all of the different dynamics and issues and, and, and theories in pharmacy. If you look at that Aspen Institute presentation or forum, um, you'll hear 20 different things that you could theoretically worry about. Um, and, and maybe I should be thinking about this or that and how to manage my costs. But um, I, I think, and, and also where will this market head? Will the government do something about this and, or will Amazon come in and save the day? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm curious to see what Amazon does, in the meantime, I would recommend focusing on the low-hanging fruit and the things that you can really control today that fit into your overall uh, docket of things that you have to take care of. Um, and if you if you do look at some of these really specific contractual terms, specific elements of your deal, um, and drill down a little bit on those in a focused way, so narrow the universe of what you do have to drill down on, um, and then and then take that education and give it a shot. Um, you're going to learn a little bit along the way, but this is valuable intelligence for you as you see how your PBM responds and, and what you can get, get from them. Um, take action, right? It, it can only help you. Um, so that my, my, my big picture uh, point for today is, is that, is, is focus on these um, few things, drill down on them a little bit, um, you know, develop a kind of a um, nascent strategy and then, and then, uh, and then try it out and see how it goes. Court, thank you for that. We've got a couple of more questions that have rolled in and we've got about four or five minutes. Um, if any of our listeners want to um, submit some questions. So the next question is one of our listeners asking for you to talk a bit about the emerging trend of international sourcing for personal use as a viable option and how that might impact the PBM contract. Okay, um, so it's, it's interesting, the uh, speaker that we had in the video, he actually, his company is kind of like a, a he used the Amazon analogy and, and compared himself to Amazon as a transparent marketplace for the payer outside of his, his or her plan. Um, so things like that, are similar, right? Uh, going internationally is, is kind of like medical tourism. It's kind of hard for a sponsor or payer to support. Um, you know, just as you look into it, it just, you immediately start again, worrying about law and, and liability. And um, it, it kind of becomes, you know, it just stops in your tracks and becomes a non-starter. Um, I don't, I don't think that the same um, hindrances are there for the, for the uh, consumer, but they do, it's still, as far as I know, hasn't taken off in a big way. Medical tourism, sourcing to phar pharmacies, more pharmaceuticals more so. Um, and that is something that is an option for them. Um, I'm honestly not sure how that fits in with, with, uh, with the plan and, uh, you know, how, how you would incorporate that because of the things I said before. Sounds good. Um, this one is a bit comment, and I think looking for some feedback from you. Um, and so there are a few acronyms that, again, I'm not familiar with, so I'll ask you to translate those in case anybody is like me. But the question and comment are the standard BAAs and NDAs and normal HIPAA adherence protect clients. So when you integrate medical claims with pharma claims, you actually get the whole picture versus just the pharma costs. Can you expand on that concept a little bit? And I yeah, can, so... Um, do you want it, me to read it one more time? Could you read the last part again, Steph? Yep. So the standard BAAs and NDAs and normal HIPAA adherences protect clients. Integrating medical claims with pharma claims actually gives you the whole picture versus just the pharma costs. So how do those things intersect and work together? So that would be um, medical plus pharma would be what I'm referring to that often, <clears throat> that often touts. 
Um, they're combining all of that data so they have a complete picture of of the of the medical situation of a member, and and it drives better predictive analytics uh, modeling of who's at risk of a health event, and then you can intervene and 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 ultimately have um, uh, stave off uh, more severe or kind of pushing past a, a point of severity in, in all of your health activity. So um, that concept is correct, and um, and it's. Uh, it's 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 true. I think um, the you have to look at what is what is the PBM and your health plan. What are they doing on that front? And I do think Optum's a good model there. Um, comparing that versus you know what your particular situation, how how they are integrating data and how they are analyzing it and what their what their predictive analytics actually are, what algorithms are based on. And um, you know, then what is the what is the output? You know, what can they show you, um, and what would they recommend? What would their recommendations be on it? Thank you. Um, another question has to do with litigation. Is there any litigation currently going on um, that might impact PBAs uh, or excuse me PBMs either in favor of the PBM or the client? So I think um, I have to take a look at this. I think there is some, some uh, the, uh, the attorney general inquiries into, um, into PBM, I think. Honestly, I have to get up to speed on that better. Um, in general, so I mentioned um, call, Representative Collins, and, and I think there are others. <clears throat> but the general kind of zeitgeist in the market is, is, is people are concerned about, about the PBM. Um, so far, I think they've been able to stave off the, the concerns and the challenges pretty effectively. Um, and, you know, it, it, if anything, I mean, I think they're kind of, they're kind of expanding their reach into some other hidden areas that people aren't, aren't looking at so much. Um, and and it would it would get back to that video that I was showing again. Uh, you know, there's the other panelists on there are kind of talking about um, regulatory context of, of how to control this stuff. But in the meantime, you've got you know the problem keeps the, the problem keeps um, you continue to bleed. Um, I, I I come from kind of a just a, a, a grassroots perspective on it, and and you know all the time I spend is on just negotiating with the PBM directly, um, you know, year after year, you, you've got this issue while, while the, while the, um, while you may or may not get any ho help or hope from, um, uh, from legislation, but, but in, um, in the event you do, there's still going to be kind of that ramp up period where you, where you, um, where you have loopholes in it and not everything's been addressed or fixed. Um, and, and within it, you, uh, it may not be a loophole, but you may have out, outright, um, you know, unwillingness to comply with certain things. I mean, a, a good example from work comp is the California fee schedule, which um, is is competitive in any delivery system whatsoever. The pricing is so good that it, you could bump it up against a, a fairly large group health program, and it would be all right. And that's a that's a that's a, a work comp fee schedule, which is typically uh, very very poor. Um, but even with that, it, it hasn't necessarily saved every pair because the PBMs have gone out and, and renegotiated rates so that you're paying above fee schedule. Um, I think it, I think so often it gets back to contract uh, and business terms, even in the face of, of these kinds of things. Well, thank you for that, Court. Um, we're at the end of our session here, and I just want to wrap things up. Again, by thanking Court for taking time to share his knowledge and insight with members and for answering our questions. Um, for our attendees, I mentioned at the outset of the webinar that we will make this recording available on the AGRIP website. That'll happen over the next few days so that it'll be available on an on-demand fashion. Um, if you have additional questions or comments, please send us an email. You can either send them directly to me or you can send it to the info at agrip.org email address, and those will get routed to us in the appropriate way. 
If there are questions that you have for court, we will pass those along to him. So with that, I want to thank everyone for your time today and um, say that we hope to see you in San Diego next month for the Governance and Leadership Conference. Thank you all for your time.